I want to say to you, you have missed devotion to Christ. It's one of the simple tests. Because then the people in the church mean more to me than the bridegroom himself. The friends of the bridegroom mean more to me than the bridegroom himself. What type of bride is that? Who is more interested in the friends of the bridegroom than the bridegroom himself? So what I'm asking you is not how close are you to the friends of the bridegroom. I'm asking you how close are you to the bridegroom himself? When you're all alone, that's the test. Do you get bored when you're alone? You can't afford to be alone. You always want to be with some brother or some sister, somebody to talk about all the time, maybe spiritual things. But alone, you get bored. My dear brothers, I want to speak the truth to you so that you don't get deceived. One of the great purposes of teaching in the church is to deliver people from deception. I believe the great work of Satan in these days is deception. He deceives people. He's called the deceiver of the whole world. And uh, he deceived Eve and he's deceived people right through till now. You know, I'll give you a simple example from the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, if you turn to 1 Chronicles, It's one of the few times in the Bible, where Satan, in the Old Testament, where Satan is mentioned. Satan appears in the book of Job, Satan appears in Genesis chapter 3, and Satan again appears in Zechariah chapter 3, where he's an accuser. In almost the entire Old Testament, apart from those two or three chapters, Satan does not even appear. But here he appears in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1. Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. And David said to Joab, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, that I may know their number. And Joab was not a man after God's own heart like David. He had more discernment than David. And he says to David, May the Lord add hundred times more my, my lord, my lord the king, they are your lord's servants. Why are you doing this? Why should you bring guilt to Israel? What is the guilt in taking a census? The census, they used to take the census of the men. The purpose was to find out how many men do I have in my army? Can I overcome the Syrians? Can I overcome the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Egyptians? I want to know the number of people, able-bodied men in Israel. Go and take a census. And that's what Joab understood. He was the general of the army. He says, David, let any number of people get added to you, but don't commit this thing. Now, does that look like evil to count the number of men in your army? It says Satan prompted David. Sometimes I want to say to you from that example, that some of the things we get prompted to do can look so innocent. Joab had more discernment than David. That it doesn't look so evil, but it was. It was an expression of confidence in the arm of flesh and not in God. Very subtle. The devil doesn't come with open deception. He won't give you an ordinary piece of paper and say, this is a hundred dollar note. <laughs> Nobody pe deceives people like that. He'll deceive you with something that looks like the real thing. So these are warnings to us to be careful that we don't get led astray from preserving ourselves in a simple devotion to Jesus Christ. It's one of the things in my own life the Lord has impressed me I don't know how it was, but from the time I was born again, I think one, I think God arranged my circumstances like that. You know, I was born into an Orthodox church, baptized as a baby. And uh, though my father was born again, he sent, never sent me to the Orthodox church, sent us to a good Sunday school. But I was never born again till I was 19 and a half. I would say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And, but I never knew what it was for Christ to be Lord of my life and central in my affections. 
And so all that time I was unsure, from the age of 13 to 19, I was up and down, up and down, up and down. But then I got converted, I was really born again, and then after I took my baptism a year and a half later, and I was 21 years old, the Lord put me on a ship, I was in the Navy, not in a battleship like I wanted to be, the exciting thing in the Navy is to be on a battleship. But I was put on what is a, a survey ship, surveying the coast of India, which is the most boring thing you can ever think of. Because most of the big cities are already surveyed. So you go to these uninhabited villages and all the part of the coast which are not surveyed, and you spend, you spend a whole year on that. And uh, nobody wants to join a survey ship in the Navy. But you know what the result was? I could never go ashore anywhere. And I was always on the ship. And uh, I was converted, so I had a Bible. And somehow at that time, the Lord allowed me to have one other book with me. An old book of my dad's, which was with me. A commentary, a small commentary on the Song of Solomon, of all the books in the Bible. So that's the only, I didn't know how to study the Bible. So I said, okay, I've got the, this one little commentary here with me. Let me read it. And so my first study of the Bible was Song of Solomon. And if you see my first Bible, that Song of Solomon, I wrote so many notes on it. You can hardly read the verses in it now. It's all, every small gap in between is written with my own notes. I was so taken up with this. That, boy, this is Christianity. To be devoted to Jesus Christ. Like this bride is to the bridegroom admires her bridegroom and the bridegroom admires the bride and this wonderful relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. I spent one year on that and somehow God kept me on that path from that time till today. I'm very thankful for that. Not that I've never slipped up or fallen, I've fallen many times, but that's, I would always come back, not to the Bible, but to simple devotion to Christ. So if I went to the Bible, it was only to find a little more about Jesus there, not another doctrine. And though I believe in the New Covenant and I've understood that fully, that is not central. I fear that many people think, to me, the New Covenant is the central part of our teaching. It is not. Let me tell you, it is not. It's devotion to Jesus Christ that is central. And there are many dear brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, who do not belong to our church, who belong to other churches, who have more devotion to Christ than many of us here. Even though they may not be able to explain the new covenant like we can. We can explain from the tree of knowledge so well. But remember this, brothers and sisters, devotion to Christ is central. If you don't realize it now, you will realize it when Christ comes back that the only thing that matters will be whether we love the Lord with all our heart or not. In fact, even in the Old Testament, the great, the one great commandment, forget the Ten Commandments, every commandment, there were 613 commandments in the Old Testament. But when somebody asked them to, the Lord to sum it up, he summed it up with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. And from that flows love for others. But it must begin with fervent love for God. It is an old covenant teaching. Not something special in the new. That's what Adam missed. I wonder whether we are missing it. I want to ask you, what is your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus? It's like my asking a wife, how much do you love your husband? Do you love him fervently? Or I can ask a husband, how do you, how's your relationship with your wife? Do you love her fervently? Not, I know you're loyal to her, you're not unfaithful, you will never divorce, all that I understand. But was your relationship with your husband and wife just a matter of fact thing? Yeah, we live in the same house and uh, she does her job and I do mine and we go out in the morning for work and come back at the end of the day and say hi and, and we're not fighting with each other. But that's not a fervent love for each other. You can understand that. In many of our Indian village families, 
There's no such thing as a husband and wife fervently loving one.